no matter how much I don't care about the petty details of people's lives who I don't like, I can't get away from knowing it. Why do I know that Paris is going to jail? Why do I know that Rosie lost her job? And why do I know that Alec Baldwin called his kid a pig? I don't know, but it's there. It's like I can't get away from tabloid news. No matter how much I try, no matter how much I try to avoid it, I still know about Anna Nicole, I miss Trump, and now Hasselhoff. Don't you just get sick of all this crazy stuff in this world? Isn't there something better? Isn't there something better to think about and to focus on? Well, you bet there is. It's Jesus Christ, and it's the coming of Jesus Christ. I think what we ought to be focused on now more than ever is the return of Jesus Christ. Why do I say that? Well, the world is coming rapidly to its final stages before Jesus Christ returns. I've noticed that believing in Jesus is one thing, but believing that Jesus will come again is another. You know, there are a lot of people in the world that are very happy if you follow Jesus as an example. They think of him as a great religious leader and a great teacher of many moral things. But as soon as you say, well, I believe Jesus is coming again, they think you're nuts. They think you're crazy. And it separates us from the world, this very hope that Jesus Christ is coming again. But the thing is that believing in Jesus and believing in his return are synonymous. Because Bible prophecy all focuses toward not only the first coming, but the second coming of Jesus Christ. Dr. George Sweeting once estimated that one-fourth of the Bible is predictive prophecy. Both the Old and New Testaments are full of predictions about the coming of the Lord Jesus. There are over 1,800 references in the Old Testament alone. Of the 39 books of the Old Testament, 17 are completely devoted to the second coming of Jesus Christ. There are 260 chapters in the New Testament and over 300 references to this glorious event, Jesus Christ coming back. Did you know that over, uh, actually, for each one prophecy of Jesus' first coming, there are eight prophecies of his second coming? As you get into the Bible, you learn very quickly that the Bible is all about the last days. And so one of the things that we look at is the fact that Jesus is coming again. The Bible lays out the scenario or for the end. And over the next few weeks, we'll be looking at different facets of this. You can almost look at this message as the appendix or the, the table of contents for what we'll be looking at in the future. What are we going to look at? Well, we're going to look at the end times. How close are we? How close is the return of Jesus Christ? What is the scenario going to look like that the Bible portrays for us before Jesus comes again? Now, in Bible college, I remember taking a class called eschatology. Eschatology is just a big word, and it means the study of last things. Eschatos means last things. Ology is the study of. And this is what we're going to look at over the next few weeks. First of all, Jesus promised that he would come back again. You have to nail this down. This is so important for you to believe. Jesus is not just a moral leader to teach you how to live. That's true. But the hope of being a Christian is that he will come again to this earth. Jesus promised that he would. Remember in John chapter 14, when he said to his disciples, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it weren't so, I wouldn't have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That is the promise of Jesus. Now, after Jesus was crucified, buried, and he resurrected, he appeared to his disciples. And at one point, he stood with them on the Mount of Olives, and as he spoke to them about the promise of the Holy Spirit, he began to ascend into heaven. And there are all of these fishermen and, and tax collectors and people that had co collected themselves to Jesus for the hope that he had of eternal life began to look at him going into heaven. And as they gazed up into the clouds, two angels appeared to them. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 11, these angels said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into heaven? Now, as an aside, that's a pretty silly question. Why do you stand gazing into heaven? Well, I'll tell you why. This Jesus just came back to life again and told us to wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Holy Spirit. And now I'm watching a man go up into heaven. That's why I'm gazing into heaven. 
Well, the angel said, why are you gazing into heaven? And they went on and said, this same Jesus, very important, who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Same Jesus in like manner. This is so crucial. It's so important because many people will go around today and they'll say that the second coming of Jesus is sort of spiritual. Oh, it's just a a Christ consciousness dude. It's just, you know, Jesus was an avatar and I've got my avatar and it's the Christ spirit that we're waiting. No, the Bible says that Jesus feet will come back down and plant on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. A literal physical return. It's so important. Zechariah 14.4 tells us that when his feet touch down on the Mount of Olives, an earthquake will strike and that mountain will rip open. Half of it will go north. Half of it will go south. Out of the ground will, will erupt rivers of water and they'll flow down into the wilderness. And the Bible predicts all the things that will happen. It will actually go down and cleanse or purify, heal the waters of the Dead Sea. Actually, the Bible says that fishermen will dry their nets at En Gedi, which is just a barren wasteland to this day. Fish will live in that sea. This will happen when Jesus Christ comes again. It's very physical. It's very real. Jesus' feet will touch down again. And so what we're looking for when we look for that is, well, it's like a stage to be set. A stage has to be set before the curtain arises. You need to have your props, don't you? If you're in drama, you realize that, well, the couch has to be there. The desk has to be here. The lamp has to be there. The plant has to be there. And as soon as all the props are set on the stage, then the director can say, you know, let's raise the curtain. And so as Christians, we look at, well, what are the props that need to be set? What kind of elements need to be in place before Jesus Christ will come again? We're just waiting for the curtain to go up and then the end or the play will begin. And so our promise as Christians is encouraged. It's stirred up when we see these props beginning to be set in place. Philippians chapter 3 verses 20 and 21 tells us that our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly await our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're waiting for Jesus to come back. Well, what are the props? What needs to be set up? What things need to happen before Jesus returns? One thing that needs to happen is that there will be a one world government. There will be a global empire in the last days. And I think humankind in his rebellious heart has always wanted this. From the time Adam and Eve wanted to rebel against God's authority and become gods of their own and they took that fruit to the time right after them when their children were Cain killed Abel. Shortly after that, Babel was a city that Nimrod built, and the sole purpose of that city of Babel was to rebel against God and to elevate man. They had two goals in mind, to deify themselves and to vilify God. They wanted to glorify themselves and denigrate God. They wanted to lift themselves up and put God down. And so man has desired to build a kingdom for himself. God scattered them there at Babel, but ever since they've been trying to get back together again. There will be in the last days a one world government. As we study through, we'll look at the book of Daniel. We'll look at the book of Revelation. Now, one man who dreamed about these future empires was a man by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. He was really the king of the world. Not Babel that was founded by Nimrod, which was dispersed by God. But a few hundred years after that, Babylon which was the reigning power in the world when Israel was dispersed and when Judah was dispersed. Now, this king, Nebuchadnezzar, had a dream. He was wondering what the future of his kingdom was going to be. And so as he lay on his bed that night and his mind was filled with the future of his kingdom, God gave him a dream. Now, this was a man who didn't mess around. He woke up in the morning and he got all of his soothsayers and his wise men and he said, I want you to tell me what my dream meant. And they said, well, tell us the dream and we'll tell you what it meant. Now, these guys were skilled at twisting things, at cold calls, you might say, at sort of uh, manipulating the situation. So Nebuchadnezzar said, no way. I'll know that you can tell me what the dream means if you tell me the dream itself. And they began to panic. And Nebuchadnezzar said, well, if you don't tell me the dream, then you're phonies, you're frauds, and uh, off with their heads. And he started having them killed. In the process, though, there was a young man by the name of Daniel and three Hebrews that had been taken from Jerusalem because they were losing their authority, their autonomy. 
And so Daniel and his three friends began to pray and began to seek God, and God gave them the dream and its interpretation. This was the dream. Nebuchadnezzar dreamed of a giant statue, an image that had a head of gold that was made up of different metals. The arms and shoulders were made of silver. The stomach was made of bronze, and the legs were made of iron. Some of you men were saying, well, my legs are made of iron too, but that was when I was younger. Well, in Daniel's interpretation, he told Nebuchadnezzar that each one of these metals represented a different kingdom. And then at the bottom, of course, were the feet. And the feet were different because they were made of iron and clay. And Nebuchadnezzar was puzzled by this. But Daniel said, God knows the dreams, and he's interpreted. He's given the interpretation. And he said, Nebuchadnezzar, you are a kingdom. You're the head of gold. But after you, another empire will come. After Babylon, another empire? Boy, it must have made Nebuchadnezzar angry. He thought his kingdom will never end. But Daniel said, yes, after you, another empire will come that represented by the arms and shoulders of silver. And later on in history, as this was fulfilled, it was actually the Medo-Persian Empire or the Persian Empire, which became the dominant empire there. Later, years after Daniel died, he said that another empire would come, which we found out was the Grecian Empire, the belly of bronze. Finally, there would be the legs of iron. And Daniel was far gone since then. And only hundreds of years in the future would the Roman Empire arise. This was pretty amazing to find out, well, Nebuchadnezzar didn't like it at all. He actually made an entire image of gold, as if to say, try to stop my kingdom. My kingdom will live forever, but it ended. Nebuchadnezzar died, the Persians came, the Greeks came, and then the Romans came after that. Now, Daniel was concerned, though. Daniel was concerned because Israel was supposed to be the light of the world. Israel was supposed to bring the promise of the Savior, but their autonomy was gone. They were, not even, they were a non-nation at this time. And so Daniel began to seek God. And God would give him the same meaning, but with different visions. Maybe you remember, as you look through the book of Daniel, that Daniel had visions of these strange animals that came. It represented those empires as they would come in succession. First, the Babylonian. Now, you have to go way back in history, because you're talking about 25, 2,600 years. The Babylonian Empire was represented in Daniel's vision as a lion. And then, of course, after the lion, this giant bear came in his vision. Daniel's going, I don't understand what's going on. And this giant bear hunched up on one side with ribs in its mouth came and smashed the lion. And the angel would tell Daniel, that's the next empire that comes. And, of course, that would be the Medo-Persian Empire. And you know about the Persian Empire. They are like a bear. They were, were huge. Perhaps you read about or saw the movie 300, speaking of the Persians who, who told Leonidas, our arrows will be so numerous that, you know, you'll, you'll be in the shade. And, of course, uh, was it Leonidas that responded? Well, then we'll fight in the shade. Because the Persians were so numerous. They were like a bear, huge. But after this, Daniel dreamed, as he had this vision, that a leopard would come. And this leopard was amazing, so fast. It even had wings on its back. A leopard's fast as it is. And Daniel watches, and this leopard just flies across, and it tramples the bear down. And the Lord tells Daniel, that's the next empire. And of course, that would represent the Grecian Empire, the Macedonian Empire. And with what speed they took over. Who was the one who conquered in the name of the Greeks? Alexander the Great. By the age of 29, he wept because there were no more nations to conquer. So quick, just like God had said. But after this leopard that Daniel saw, there was another beast. Strange. Strange beast with all these horns and it had teeth of iron. And that represented the Roman Empire. But here what happened was there was a pause in God's timeline when it came to the empires of the world. Why? Because Jesus came. Jesus came to the people, his own people, the Jews, and they rejected him. And so there's sort of a parenthesis in God's timeline when it comes to the nations. Because Jesus was rejected by the Jews, but then received by the Gentiles. And so between the iron legs and the feet of iron and clay, which we'll study more in a couple of weeks so that you'll have a firm grasp on it, there was a parenthesis, a time period, because the church began. It's sort of the age of the church. Jesus came, Israel missed him. The church was born. The church was born, but Israel would die, so to speak. Israel would be scattered into the far reaches of the Roman Empire. Now, the Roman Empire would fade into time, but never utterly be dismissed or destroyed. Now, the Bible says in the last days, the Roman Empire will come back together or vestiges of it. See, because in that dream of Nebuchadnezzar, the last empire before 
In his dream, you recall, a rock came out of heaven. A stone came out of heaven and smashed the feet. And it grew up into a great mountain, the kingdom of God. Now, in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the feet were made of both iron and clay. What does that mean? Well, it means that in the last days, there will be a new, different sort of Roman Empire. The vestiges of old Rome, that democracy that ruled the world, and a new group of kings. Sort of a clay, tribal empire or nations. Now, the Caesars of Rome have long passed, but recently we've even seen nations like, well, the Russians, they had Tsars, didn't they? The word Tsar is Caesar, it's the same thing. And you also had the Kaisers in Germany. Same word, Caesar. And so you've got the vestiges of these empires sort of floating around. Well, the last days says that there will be sort of a league of nations that will be extremely hostile to Christianity. And as you look around, you wonder, do you see a revived Roman Empire combined with sort of the democracies of yesteryear and the tribal clans, the clay nations of today, hostile to Christianity And the nation of Israel, as you look around, do you see sort of a group of united nations that hate Israel with a passion and hate Christianity? Roman style democracies and primitive clay like clans hating Israel? Yes, of course you do. That's what the UN is all about. Hating Israel, hating Christianity. But the Bible says in the last days they will grow in power like never before. So a one world government we will look at that in detail. One thing that we'll also look for is that Israel will stand alone in the last days. Israel will be alone in the world without a friend at all. Now, this is where a lot of traditional churches get the end times wrong. They believe that Israel is done for, that God has no plan for them. And I don't blame them because for about 2,000 years, Israel didn't exist, did they? They were scattered. They were just, you know, Jews floating around. But in 1948, Israel became a nation again. The key to understanding the end times is Israel. Jews were scattered for 2,000 years, but God still has a a plan for them. We're going to spend some of our time looking at Israel in our series. Israel rejected Jesus. The Jews rejected their own Messiah. I spoke to a man the other day. I saw him uh, as I was on the street, and uh, we just started talking about politics because I was in politics, and I didn't like it too much. But he said, oh, you were the best. And that made me feel good because I wasn't the best. Good, maybe, but not the best. <laughs> and uh, some reason the Lord prompted me to just mention Jesus to this man. We had no association spiritually. And he said, how are you doing? I said, the Lord's good. And again, the Lord prompted me to use the name of Jesus. And you know how sometimes when you go back and forth, Lord, I mean, can I just say the Lord is good? Because that's a little more nebulous. But the Lord prompted me again. He almost put it in my mouth. I said, Jesus has been good. Finally, I obeyed the Lord. And he said, I'm a Jew, you know, don't put... And I didn't know he was Jewish. And I said, well, I believe in the greatest Jew that ever lived. You should too. And uh, we began to talk there. But you see, Israel rejected Jesus. But he's Jewish. He was an Israeli to the core. Now, they rejected him, which meant that we could accept him. How many of you are glad that God accepts Gentiles too, non-Jews, right? Now, that was the plan of God from the beginning, that they wouldn't recognize him. I mean, this happened over and over again. What are the great leaders of Israel? Joseph. Joseph was rejected by his brothers, but they accepted Jesus in a time of, of tribulation, a time of famine, seven years of famine. Moses, another great leader of the Jews, he was rejected the first time. Remember when he went and they said, who are you, a judge over us? And he had to flee until finally the, the hostility and the slavery was so great that they cried out to God. David, another leader, rejected the first time. King Saul kicked him out. He ran around in the wilderness until their enemies were just about defeating them. So too with Jesus. He was rejected the first time, but he will be received by the nation of Israel during a period of great trial, the time of Jacob's trial, time of Jacob's trouble. Talks about the tribulation. And so God is not finished with Israel yet. You have to understand that. As the church was born, Israel seemed to die. And in the present time, we have what we know as the church age. But it doesn't mean that God is finished with Israel. We talked about the book of Hosea a couple of weeks ago, how in chapter 5 and 6, God says that he will return to heaven until his people acknowledge their transgression. And for two days, of course, the Bible says that to the Lord, a thousand years is as one day. And a day is as a thousand years. And we recognize that God was giving us sort of a code there. That for two days the nation of Israel would be desolate, but then it says he will raise us up on the third day. 
And we said that's a linchpin. That's crucial for prophecy because the nation of Israel has become, well, it's become a nation again in 1948. Now, most of us find that that's just a normal part of life. But if you lived prior to 1948, the prophecies concerning Israel in the Bible made no sense. And so the fact that Israel has become a nation again is incredible. Not only has Israel become a nation again, but even the Hebrew language has revived again. It was a dead language for almost 2,000 years. We'll look at in our study Israel alone that even the resurrection of the language of Hebrew was a fulfillment of prophecy. The Bible says in Zechariah chapter 12 that in the last days, Jerusalem will be, well, it says a burdensome stone. And every nation on the world that tries to lift it will hurt themselves. Have you ever tried to lift something up and you hurt your back? Well, maybe not some of you young guys, but some of the older guys, you've tried to lift something, oh, my back. Something's happened there. Well, the Bible says that in the last days, everybody will be concerned with Jerusalem. Now, wait a second. Just wait a second. Jerusalem is nothing. It has no strategic location. It has no resources that are of any value. What kind of crazy prophet would say that in the future, Jerusalem would be the focus of all nations? Well, the kind of crazy prophets that wrote the scripture, that's who. Because they were right. Why is all the world focused on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict centered in the nation of Israel and focused on the city of Jerusalem? Well, the Bible says that's exactly the way it's going to be when Jesus Christ comes again. I mean, sometimes I think that we get so used to living in the last days that we forget that these are the last days. It's like looking out of a window. You're looking through the glass and you almost forget that it's there. And as we look at the world today, the fact that the Jews are in the land, the fact that Hebrew is a spoken language, the fact that Israel is not a swamp but a thriving nation is amazing end times prophecy. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Eventually, the world is going to collect themselves against Israel. Jerusalem, Israel, is going to be the linchpin for the global struggle against, I think, well, Islam and the West and ultimately the whole world. Not one particular religion, but the whole world and Israel. The Bible says all the nations of the world will gather around Israel. Boy, I read Internet news and the stuff that you see on All over the world, anti-Semitism is worse now even than it was in the 30s in Germany. The Jews are hated and vilified more than anybody else in the world. It is radical. And when we get to that study, I will show you some of the most incredible things that you've ever seen. The fact that Mein Kampf was on the bestseller list in Turkey as recently as last year. It's the bestseller in Egypt right now. Hitler's Mein Kampf. Did you know that? Oh, you'll you'll just see the hatred for the Jews all over the world right now. That is pointing to the last days. And so when Israel as a nation is under threat from all these nations in the world, they will call out to Jesus and Jesus will come again. Jesus will come again when Israel turns back to him as a nation. Luke chapter 13 and Matthew chapter 23 record how Jesus coming into Jerusalem, knowing that they would reject him, he began to speak to the city as a city figuratively. And he said, I tell you to Jerusalem, you will not see me again until the time when you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The first time he came, they said, cursed are you. And they had him crucified with the help of the Romans. But the next time he comes is when they will say, oh, Lord, come back. Blessed are you who come in the name of the Lord. Jesus will return. And so a world empire, the nation of Israel, but also the Antichrist. Who is the Antichrist and why is he called the Antichrist? Well, he's called the Antichrist because he's actually hailed as the Messiah. Israel is going to be in such dire straits because they've actually hailed the wrong man as their savior. Jesus said to them, Over in John chapter 5, verse 43, I come in my Father's name and you don't receive me. But another will come in his own name. Him you will receive. The nation of Israel, looking at the situation around the world, seeing the hostility and hatred, will see a new leader arising that seems sympathetic to their cause and their plight. And they will make a contract with him and they will hail him as their savior. But he'll be nothing like a savior. He'll be an anti-savior, an anti-Christ. 
the leader of this revived amalgamation of Roman Empire and weaker states, tribal nations, will be the Antichrist. He'll be charismatic. He'll be powerful. He'll offer hope and peace to the world. Israel's going to hail him as their Messiah. And yet, he's going to be the culmination of man's rule on the earth. Never has more power been concentrated in one person. He's going to be like a god. People will worship him as a god. Nobody's going to be able to stand against him or his empire. That sort of covers the earth like a giant octopus. And so along with this global government and the Antichrist, there will be a singular global economy. The Bible talks about the mark of the beast. A lot of people have heard that term, 666. What does it mean? Well, the Bible prophesied about 2,000 years ago that one day everybody on the earth will have an identification that will link them to this one world government. It will show their affinity toward the Antichrist. And without this mark, without membership in this giant club, this global empire, you will not be able to buy or to sell. Now, I always laugh at those old sci-fi movies. You ever watch those sci-fi movies from the 60s? You probably don't because they were so poor. And the special effects were so bad. But the funny thing about it is how wrong they were about the future of menswear, weren't they? Have you ever looked at that? These, these, these shows from the 60s, and it seems like everybody just said, you know what, let's quit wearing different things. Let's all wear spandex silver pants and a silver jumpsuit with a big red V down the middle, and how wrong they were. And their, their futuristic shows actually pointed forward all the way to the year of 2001. And we've long passed that. And it's funny to see how wrong they were, how humorous that was. But if you look at this prophecy, I mean, this is just mind-blowing. That 2,000 years ago, when the furthest thing from any human being's mind was computers, everybody can be linked and tracked through a mark? I mean, you can't even fathom. Now, for us, that is not only feasible, but it's practical. Everybody in the world can be tracked through computers, through a microchip, through a a barcode, through a database. Not only is it feasible, but it's beginning to happen already. And when you think of the ramifications, think of what this means. That John the Apostle wrote that in the last days, everybody would be tracked by a number. It's shocking. It's one of the things that points to the fact that we are in the last days. It's mind-boggling. Now, the book of Revelation not only describes that there will be an Antichrist and there will be a mark of the beast, but it also describes a singular global religion. That is, all religions, well, probably more accurate to say, a singular singular umbrella that covers and contains every world religion. There will be one religion in the last days, and you might call it tolerance. Tolerate everybody's religion, give credit to everybody, Accept any religion that says they're exclusive. And who does that leave out? Jesus Christ. I am the way, he said. I am the truth. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. And so in the last days, there will be an Antichrist. And actually, there's going to be another man called the false prophet. And he's going to rule over a perverse, sick church. Actually, the Bible says that the church of God is is like a, a, a virgin bride, untouched by the world pure and white. And you see this through the book of Revelation. And then when you come to chapter 17 of Revelation, something has happened to what once was the bride of Christ on the earth. It's no longer the bride of Christ. It's called the whore of Babylon. The church has become perverted and disgusting in the eyes of God. And there in the book of Revelation, there is a woman that rides on the top of this One world government. Revelation 17, a woman riding on the beast. And she's wearing purple. She's drenched in the blood of the saints because of the persecution. She fills the earth with her adultery and her idolatry. She's wealthy. She's rich. And so in the last days, there will be a singular world religion. Why do I point this out? Well, because you can see these things beginning to happen. Governments are beginning to emerge and converge together. Religions are beginning to hail as the singular most greatest quality, tolerance above all else. Not truth. It doesn't matter. Their truth is is theirs and your truth is yours and it doesn't really matter. You're beginning to see it. You're beginning to see the technology that makes possible the very things of the last days. And so the Antichrist, 
and the false prophet which commands everybody to follow him and to worship them will be energized by Satan himself. It's almost like a, a counterfeit trinity. You have the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Perfect trinity. God's trinity. And then on the dark side, there's Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. Not opposites, but a pitiful sort of counterfeit. Far weaker. Satan is not the opposite of God. Satan is a, a puny angel, and God is almighty and infinite. So never think of Satan's power as even coming close to matching God's. Greater is he who is in you, the Bible says, right? than he who is in the world. And so we see that there will be a one world government. There'll be Israel standing alone. There will also be the Antichrist and the mark of the beast. Now, the Antichrist is going to make a covenant with Israel, the Bible says, probably allowing them to rebuild their third temple. Israel will hail him as their Messiah. And he will cut a seven-year treaty, a covenant with Israel. And in the middle of that covenant, the Bible says that he will march into the temple of God and he'll set up, set up an image and he will command the world to worship him as God. The Bible calls this an abomination. This is such an abomination that it will obliterate the world. It will utterly decimate Jerusalem. It's called the abomination of desolation. Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, the Bible actually puts a parenthesis there and says, whoever reads, let him understand. Matthew 24, verses 15 to 18. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on his housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And Jesus said, whoever is in the field, don't go back to get your clothes. In other words, Jesus says to those people who are still on the earth at this time, when you see this happen, when you see the world leader stride into the temple and say, I'm God, worship me, you hightail it for the wilderness. Don't even pack your bags because what's going to happen at this time is all heaven will break loose. Well, all hell will break loose as well. It's called the tribulation. And so we look for things like technology, identification technology that can plug a person into a global system. We look for things like the unification of economies, governments, and religions. We look for the potential and the possibility of the rebuilding of a temple in Jerusalem. And we look for the concentration of power in one person who brings hope to the world by bringing peace treaties. The Bible says in the last days they will say peace, peace, and then sudden destruction will come. What is that destruction? It's called the tribulation. The tribulation, the great tribulation. It's not great for people that are on the earth, but it is great in the fact that it is powerful. See, God judged the world in Noah's day, didn't he? He flooded the earth. He also judged Sodom and Gomorrah in Lot's day. And the Bible says he will judge the world again. As a result of people's sin and rebellion, God will unleash heaven, not like you think, on the earth. Like an antiseptic, the judgments of God will purify the earth. He's also going to unleash hell on the earth. Literally, demonic hordes, activity will go haywire as demons are released to wreak havoc on the earth. Jesus said over in Matthew chapter 24, verses 21 and 22, For then there will be a great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And if those days had not been shortened, no one would survive. There's a time of judgment coming on the earth like nothing you've ever imagined. The book of Revelation is primarily concerned with describing this period. From chapter 6 to chapter 19, we read about the judgments of God. John the Apostle finds himself in heaven during this period where the angels of God begin to pour out sort of bowls and vials, and they break open seals, like in scrolls back then they would have seals that would, you would break it open and read a portion. And as they do, the judgments of God that come upon the earth are almost unimaginable. And it happened in a very short period of time. As soon as the Antichrist, three and a half years into this covenant with Israel, breaks that contract, God begins to pour out his wrath. Three and a half years of ultimate hell on the earth. The majority, I repeat, majority of the people on earth will die. I'm not talking thousands, millions, billions of people will die on the earth. You cannot imagine there's not a drama, there's not a book, there's not a play, there's not a movie made that can even come close to describing 
the absolute hell that will unleash on the earth. Jesus himself said, there's never been a time like it and there never will be a time like it. Billions of people will perish in natural disasters. Well, there'll be supernatural disasters, not natural. They'll perish by disease and by famine. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 7, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. As I mentioned, most of the book of Revelation describes the plagues and pestilence of this time. As people perish, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 16, verses 8 and 9 tell us this about the tribulation period. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun. And the sun was given power to scorch people with fire. And men were scorched with intense heat. And they blasphemed the name of God who had power over these plagues. And they did not repent and give him glory. So the sun's going to get hotter. Not just a little. By the way, the sun is getting hotter. Did you know that? The polar ice caps on Mars are melting. The earth is getting a little warmer. Contrary to popular opinion, it's not man's doing. It's God's doing. The sun is getting warmer. But in the last days, it will get extremely hotter in a moment. The Bible says it will scorch people on the earth. Jesus said in Luke 21, verse 25, stay here in Revelation, please. But in Luke 21, 25, Jesus said there will be signs in the sun. Jesus said this would happen. And on the earth, distress of nations, ethnic groups will strive with one another. Perplexity. And Jesus said in Luke 21, verse 25, the sea and the waves roaring. Waves roaring, that's right. Since there will be earthquakes on the earth, there will also be tsunamis. Massive earthquakes will shake the world. Jesus said they will be perplexed at the roaring of the waves. Well, in Revelation 16, we read about the greatest earthquake that is yet to come on the earth. The Bible says there's an earthquake coming that we've never seen before. Richter scales won't even apply. This thing will shake like a drunken man stumbling on the street. That's how the Bible describes it. In Revelation 16, verse 18, you should be there. It says, there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as has not occurred since men were on the earth. And every island disappeared, verse 20. And every island disappeared. And all the mountains were leveled. What does that mean? It means Hawaii will be wiped off the map. Actually, the the map will be wiped off the map. Earth will change. The earth will shake. And the Bible says... Every island will flee away. Tsunamis, I don't know, a thousand feet high. You can't even imagine it. You don't want to be here in that time. Hailstones like boulders. The Bible says there in Revelation 16, 21, great hail from heaven. Huge hailstones, about a hundred pounds. The NIV helps us to understand the weight of a talent. A talent is about 34 kilograms. Hailstones, about a hundred pound each, fell upon men and they cursed God on account of the plague of hail because the plague was so terrible. Later, the Bible says that meteors will come and and strike the earth, polluting every stream, killing every living thing on the earth. And the Bible says the planet will stink because of all the dead creatures floating around. No drinking water. And the Bible says they will curse God to their face because they hate him for what he's doing. And then it's interesting because an angel from heaven says, blessed be you, Lord, because they deserve it. Those who are on the earth will deserve it. The Bible says that those people, people on the earth will be as scarce as gold. How many times have you found a chunk of gold sitting on the street? Never. You could walk around your whole life on the earth if you have one and never find a person because people will be scarce. Billions will die. We're already seeing... The signs of those things beginning to happen, the potential threat of super viruses, the fact that the sun is heating up, earthquakes and tsunamis all over the world, ethnic strife among nations around the world. The great tribulation is coming. Very few will survive. Can you survive? Well, you won't survive, but you can escape. You can escape. How? Well, through the rapture. The Bible talks about the rapture. Prior to the time that God judged the earth and pours out his wrath, the church will be raptured, taken out of the way, being transferred into heaven. Well, what's the rapture? Well, there's a scripture over in the book of Acts where Philip is preaching to a man and he baptizes him. And as he brings the man up, he disappears from his sight. 
And God translates him from one place to another. That's what the rapture is. The Bible says that in the twinkling of an eye, in a moment, we will be changed and we will be caught up together with Jesus Christ in the clouds. That is, we will be raptured. Well, quicker than that. It says in the twinkling of an eye. A blinking of an eye is much shorter than a twinkling of the eye. Rapture is not a euphoric feeling. The rapture is an important doctrine in the Bible. It's when the age of the church is done and God moves his attention back to Israel. All the believers will be carried up to heaven in a flash. True Christians will not experience the great tribulation. You will have tribulation in the world, but the source of that is from the devil himself. But you will not have God's tribulation. The Bible says that you are not appointed to wrath. First Thessalonians 5.9 says this, God did not appoint us to wrath but to obtain of salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so you're in Revelation 16. Let's look at Luke chapter 21. Some people reject the rapture. They say, oh, it's just escapism. I say, amen, hallelujah. It is escapism. Jesus said in Luke 21, verse 36, these words, watch therefore and pray. Actually, back up, verse 35. It will come as a snare or a trap on all those who dwell on the face of the earth. So watch and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape. That's right. Escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So we don't know when the rapture will come. Jesus said no one knows the day or the hour. So watch and be ready. At the same time, we can see what Jesus called birth pangs. Now, you might know that my wife and I have had a few children. She did some of the work, a lot of the work, actually. But I was there. And one thing we noticed, as you've noticed as well, that there's always contractions. And you know the baby's really coming when the contractions get closer together and more intense. And so Jesus said that the things that are happening now will be like birth pangs or contractions. The more frequently you see earthquakes, the more frequently you see great disasters like pestilence, the more frequently you see signs in the sun, whether it be sunspots or the heat coming, know for certain, know for sure that my coming is even closer. We don't know when the rapture will happen, but we can be pretty sure that it's close. Jesus said to his disciples, we're still in Luke chapter 21, after they had asked him, When these things will happen, when the time will be, he said in Luke 21, verse 28. Now, when these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. When you see these things beginning to happen, heads up. That's what we say today. Look up, get ready because it's going to happen. Once the rapture happens, everything that we've discussed, the Antichrist, Israel, will rapidly come into play. Governments will merge, coalesce, they will amalgamate. Israel will come into intense pressure from world governments. The Antichrist will arise and become a hero for Israel. He'll cut a contract for seven years. A universal identity system will be put in place allowing you to buy and sell with a mark implanted on your right hand or on your forehead. And then Antichrist will turn on Israel and launch the fiercest persecution the Jews have ever known. Hitler will be like child's play compared to this. Only about 150,000 Jews will be left over. Believers, if you come to Jesus Christ in this time, you will be beheaded. It's interesting to me today that when John wrote this, this was happening. But for 2,000 years, beheading wasn't common until today. Islam loves to behead people. They even get their kids to do it on TV, and they film it and put it on the Internet. And so Israel will flee to the wilderness at this time and God will protect them for three and a half years. And then finally, Armageddon will come. The Antichrist will gather all the nations of the world, millions of those left over in the vast plain of Megiddo in Israel. And they'll fight against the Lord. Psalm chapter 2 describes this scene. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? What vain thing? Well, they're going to fight against God. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his Messiah. Anointed is the word there. And they say, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast their cords away from us. We're sick of God's authority, they'll say. But he who sits in heaven, verse 4 tells us, shall laugh. God will laugh at them. He'll mock them. The Lord will hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath. 
He'll speak to them in his wrath, the word of his mouth. And he will distress them in his deep displeasure. And then the psalmist writes, But I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. That's Jesus. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. And then God turns to the people gathered against him. And he says, now therefore be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled just a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in the Lord. Jesus Christ will come back when the armies of the world are gathered in Megiddo to fight against God. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 2.8 that Jesus will return and he will consume the Antichrist with the breath of his mouth. The Bible says that out of his mouth comes a two-edged sword. The whole world will say, who can fight against the Antichrist? He's so powerful. And Jesus will come back, and the Bible says, with the breath of his mouth, he will destroy him. Literally, he will blow him away. The Bible says he'll be cast into the lake of fire. Jesus will begin to restore the earth. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 16, this vision of Jesus. He sat on a white horse, and he came down. And out of his mouth went a two-edged sword. Revelation 19, beginning in verse 11. I saw heaven opened, behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head, many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. And he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has a name on his robe and on his thigh written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He's tramping out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. Blood spattered on him because he's coming in the fierceness of his wrath. And so Jesus will throw the false prophet and the Antichrist into the lake of fire. Satan will be bound for a thousand years. And what will begin is called the millennium, a beautiful time on the earth, a thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. It's called the day of the Lord. It begins with his wrath but it goes beautifully for a thousand years where Jesus will rule himself from the city of Jerusalem. And those Christians will be emissaries throughout the world, bringing his righteousness and his rule. There will be perfect peace and harmony. This is where we read about the lion lying down with the lamb. Actually, it doesn't ever say that. Now, if a lion lies down with a lamb, the lamb is actually in the belly of the lion. We don't have lions and lambs laying down. The Bible says that the wolf will lie down with the lamb. You can read that in Isaiah 11, verses 6 through 9. The Bible said that kids will actually lead lions as their pets. Can you imagine your babysitter coming over and it's a lion, a 700-pound muscular cat? The Bible says that lions will eat grass like cows in those days. Babies will play at the snake's hole. Rattlesnakes, you know, that's why God made rattlesnakes, for the kids. They're little rattles. But that's what it will be like in the end. The Bible says that people will live to be about a thousand years old. Nobody will die easily in those days. It says that as the, the, the days of a tree, Isaiah 65, 22, so shall the days of my people be. How long do trees live? A thousand years. They'll say that when somebody dies at a hundred years old, they say, oh, what a shame he was so young. A hundred years old, what a shame. Because it's the time of the millennium. The world will repopulate quickly and immensely under these conditions. Over this time of peace, Satan bound, Jesus ruling, the earth will be a paradise until the end. After those times, after those thousand years, Satan will be released for a short period to test people who live on the earth. They will rebel. They will actually rebel against Jesus Christ. And then the end will come. The Lord will say, all right, let's wrap this thing up. We're done here. And the Bible says that there will be a resurrection. It's called the second resurrection because the rapture is the first resurrection. You want to go in the first resurrection. You don't want to go in the second 
resurrection. Actually, if you're still over in Revelation 19, look at Revelation 20, verse 6. It says, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him a thousand years. And so from that time, the whole world, everybody will be resurrected a second time. Well, it's the second resurrection, a thousand years after the millennium, and they will stand before Christ at what's called the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment. You don't want to stand here. You don't want to stand here. Nobody is found innocent. Everybody is found guilty. The Bible says books were open and all your deeds are recorded and read before God. And in a moment, Jesus will wrap up the whole world. Everybody standing before the great white throne will be thrown into the lake of fire. The Bible calls it the second death, where every soul will burn in torment for all eternity. Satan himself as well. And those who belong to Jesus will at that point enter into the eternal state All creation, the Bible says, will be rolled up like an old scroll, like an old garment just rolled up and thrown out. And Peter says the elements themselves will melt with an intense heat. Every atom will be let go. It will be unbound. The universe, you know the universe means singular spoken word, singular spoken verse, universe. I'll tell you what the universe is. In the beginning, let there be. It came out of the mouth of God and everything was. Well, the universe is going to be wiped out In the same amount of time, Jesus will say, let there be not. And every atom, every particle, every element will let go and disseminate. Peter says the elements themselves will melt with an intense heat. And then we will enter into a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness lives. Perfect peace and harmony forever and ever. We'll journey deeper and deeper into the infinite heart of God There'll be a never-ending increase to the joy and the bliss that we'll experience as we worship in his presence. And at this point, our imagination just fails. We cannot even imagine. We can't grasp anything that's in store for us, only through a taste of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it even entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Romans chapter 8, verse 18, Paul says, I consider the sufferings of this present time not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. Momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory. Far beyond all comparison. Because we don't look to what is seen, but to what is unseen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are are eternal. The last verse I want to look at as we close is in 2 Peter chapter 3. As you turn there, remember that John said in 1 John chapter 3, Beloved, we are children of God, and it hasn't been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Peter tells us this, and he asks us a pertinent question. If there's any application this morning as we close, it's this one thing. Peter says in 2 Peter 3, verses 10, The day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. That literally is big bang, great noise. The world didn't start in a big bang, it will end in a big bang, if you didn't know that. And the elements will melt with a fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Verse 11 says, Therefore... Since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? That's the question. All this is going to pass away. What kind of people are we going to be? How shall we then live? There's so many distractions in this world, but to focus on the coming of Jesus Christ is the most important thing in the world.